Fisher and Julia, <laughs> my apologies. It's actually Murphy's Law that if you're on the list to be a lecturer, you'll get a passage like that eventually. <laughs> I, I remember the last time I had a passage like that that really was troubling. All the Elamites and Benjamites turned into termites and whatever else. And, uh, it's, it's not easy to do that. And I applaud those of you who are electors to stand up and read because, you know, we're all in the same boat. If you think the preachers have all their pronunciations down pat, you think you've got another thing coming. It just doesn't happen. But here's a little hint. If, uh, if ever you're worried about pronunciation like that, if you download, if you've got a computer, you download the Bible app, most of the Bible apps have a pronunciation. And if you highlight a bunch of names like that, you can press that button and you can hear them. And, and it gives you a little bit more confidence, I guess. All right, we are back in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. We're at a very familiar passage the passage of the Pharisee and the publican, the, uh, the religious guy and the tax collector. And uh, I'd like for you to pray with me as we begin. Lord, help us to see the sense of this story that Jesus told about uh, a religious man and a very non-religious man. Help us to understand the attitudes involved and the eye problems that uh, perhaps we all need to correct at times. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 9. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. Sounds like Jesus is about to tell a joke. Two men walked into a bar. <laughs> Uh, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. Notice he stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else. How humble of him. <laughs> For I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery, and I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. I tell you, <coughs> this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of our Lord. So, two men go to worship. One is accepted by God, and the other is rejected. The one is a Pharisee, a very religious person. He's a pillar of the community. The other is a publican, a tax collector. Certainly not the most popular guy on the block. The pub, uh, to, to figure some of this out, we have to know a little bit about who these guys were in their society. Publicans or tax collectors were Jews. But they were unacceptable to their own people because they worked for the Roman government. And what did they do? They took an exorbitant tax. Don't forget, Rome had conquered Israel and uh, they were under Roman dominion at that point and they had to pay taxes to Rome. It would be the same thing if another country conquered us. They would demand tribute from us. Uh, well, unfortunately, the tax collectors that they had were always the locals who were part of the population. I guess it was less problem for Rome that way, but what it, what it meant was that the Jews who became tax collectors collecting the tax for Rome uh, were despised. And they were despised not just because they were paying... How many of you love paying taxes? Let me see your hand. I don't have many takers there. I don't like paying taxes. I try to pay what I'm, what's supposed to be. I, don't, I think it's wrong to cheat the government. The Bible says that Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And so we, we have to do right where all that's concerned. But these guys were hated, not just because it was a Roman tax, but because the tax collectors would actually take more than Rome demanded. They would... They would cheat. They would extort money. 
And so these were their own Jewish brothers extorting money from their brothers. The publican was actually what you would call Benedict Arnold. He was a traitor to his own people. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were very respected. They were the religious leaders. They were the stars of the day, if you will. And they weren't just leaders in the temple. They were leaders in civic community as well. In that day, it was one and the same. If you were a Pharisee, you were also a civic leader as well. Uh, you know, <coughs> preacher and, and mayor, if you will. So the story's conclusion here that Jesus was telling about two men that go to uh, worship, and the Pharisee praying, and the, and the publican, the tax collector praying, the story's conclusion should have been a slam dunk for the listeners. What should have been the story as far as they were concerned? The religious guy wins hands down. Shame on that, that publican for showing up at church at all. But Jesus' punchline did what? It pulled a switch. It turned it all on its ear. The tax collector is the guy who winds up right with God, and the church elder becomes the bad guy. And you say, what is with it? What's up with this? Notice, please, if you will, there are some similarities and some differences in worship here between a religious man and a renegade. The renegade had humility. The religious man had an eye problem. And I'm not talking about the physical eyes. I'm talking about the eye problem. He prayed with that pronoun, with, with, with that uh, personal pronoun uh, all through his prayer. So notice the similarities as well as the differences. First of all, a similarity is that they both stood. Both stood. The scripture says they stood and they prayed. Both the Pharisee and the tax collector stood. What's uh, the difference here is betrayed in the meaning of the word that is used. When the scripture starts out that Jesus said that the two men went to the temple to pray, it says in verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself. He stood. And the word means he stood there in confidence. It's a man who has no fear and he is just holding court. Somebody once uh, told me that uh, if ever I preach like that, like I'm absolutely confident in everything that I'm going to say, then I better not get into the pulpit. I better, I better not approach God's people like that. Certainly, if you don't approach God's people with all of that confidence, self-assured, you certainly don't approach the God of those people in that way. This is a picture of man standing erect with absolutely no fear. The tax collector, it says, also stood. But his word is different. There's a different word in the Greek language that Jesus used. And that word means to just about barely be there. In other words, the tax man was slumped over. He was hardly daring to lift his eyes heavenward. He was not confident. He was appealing by sneaking in the back door, so to speak. The main difference here is how a man stands when he stands before God. It's whether or not he stands with humility or arrogance. Multiple times, Scripture tells us that God opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble. So they both stood. Secondly, they also both prayed. Once again, the difference between the two men was an attitude. The publican did what? The, the tax guy asked for mercy. While the Pharisee was there to inform everybody with an earshot, including God and the tax collector, just how good a man he really was. Both of these men told God who and what they are and guess what? Both of them were right. Did you hear what the publican said, what the tax guy said? Lord, be merciful to me because I am a sinner. He said it out loud. In the language of the New Testament, the man actually was saying, I am the sinner. He didn't say, I am a sinner, one of many. He said, I'm the sinner. I'm the worst of all. Isn't that what Paul said? In 1 Timothy, when he was writing to the pastor, Paul, uh, Paul said this, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst of them all. I think if you have a King James Bible, it says, 
chief among all. Chief sinner. I'm the worst sinner. I'm the worst that was ever created. That's what the publican was saying. I'm the sinner. What did the Pharisees say? On the other hand here, the Pharisee simply tells God that he was good and didn't need mercy. He did all these wonderful things. He thanked God he wasn't like ordinary men, especially that tax collector standing over there. You have to wonder in your sanctified imagination how that tax collector <coughs> felt when the publican, when, when the Pharisee pointed it out and said, I, I'm glad I'm not like that one over there. The Pharisee uh, had a prayer that was really like an infomercial for God to see just how good he was. God was supposed to be impressed with this good man's goodness. So they both stood, they both prayed, and guess what? They both received something. They both received. Jesus said that the tax collector went away from the experience having received the forgiveness of God. The Bible says that he went away justified. What does that word justified mean? It means to be put back at right with God. You can think of it this way if you break the word up. Justified just as if I had never sinned. Just as if I never sinned. That's what to be justified means. More about that in just a second. Uh, Jesus said that the tax collector was forgiven. But he said that the Pharisee also received something. What did he receive? Well, it doesn't say it specifically in the text, but I believe that what the Pharisee got was that warm, fuzzy feeling inside that he had once again been to church. Um, he had uh, done his duty. He had prayed. He had given. He had fasted. He lived an honest life all week. He had been faithful to his wife. In all, he was a godly Example of what a godly man was like and didn't they all know it down there at the church? The only problem was that he had no real meeting with God that day. Herb Lockyer said this about that uh, religious man, this religious pray man. He said he asked for nothing, he confessed nothing, and therefore he received nothing. He went away with the warm, fuzzy feeling that, boy, he had shown up at church and didn't they all approve of him? Didn't they all admire him? And wasn't he, didn't he, wasn't he the possessor of just the finest reputation? Well, here's the story. The question is, what do we do with it? Well, if we're honest, we have to go to that place deep down inside where there is nothing but truth about who we are and make application here. If you want to understand Phariseeism and Pharisees don't look outside the church. Just look inside the church. Look for the people who tend to judge others and stay angry all the time. Isn't that what we see here? I mean, the Pharisee stood there and he prayed and he pointed a finger at the publican. He was judging the publican. He was angry at the publican. And I think he wasn't necessarily angry at the publican. He was angry that the publican even existed. And he was angry that he had to be good while the publican could live like he wanted to. And sometimes, uh, you know, we play the good son at home because we do go to church, we do fast, we do pray, da 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 We list all those things, and those other guys get to have all the fun. You can recognize the narrow mind of a Pharisee. Some people say that a Pharisee's mind was so narrow he could eat corn on the cob through a picket fence. However, in looking at the motives of others in order to compare ourselves to them, we become Pharisees ourselves. That's the problem. You know, if you begin to judge the Pharisees, you become the Pharisee, right? And that's the religious guy's problem. He was comparing his goodness to the renegade's terrible life when he should have been comparing himself to God, and that would have changed things entirely about his prayer, wouldn't it? If you become like the Pharisee, you're going to remain as lost as he is. The publican recognized that he was a sinner and he asked for mercy. The Pharisee was just completely satisfied with his brand of religion. He had nothing that he had to confess. And the upshot of that, if we're going to make the application here to us, is that when you become a Pharisee, what you're going to do is destroy genuine evangelism. 
You know what evangelism is? It's just telling other people about the love of God and how good God is. Pharisees are more interested in how well they follow the rules. You don't do this, you don't do this, you certainly don't do that. And, you know, you, this is what you got to do, and you got to do this, and you got to gotta check it off, all that stuff. And you got to check it off every week, and you got to be good that way. How many people think that you'll win a lot of people with that kind of thinking, with that kind of behavior? Just that you check off how good you are, but you still despise the people who aren't living up to your standard. If you really want to do God's will, don't tell God and others how good you are. Tell others how good God is. That's evangelism. So, the case for humility is made with this whole story that Jesus told. It's about this teenager who once asked his mother what she got out of church, and the teen knew that his mother thought the sermons were always kind of boring and dull, and the music was uninspiring. And so each time he asked her about that, she responded, I don't know. I, I don't know why I enjoy church so much. I just feel better all week when I've been to church on a Sunday. You know, why did the mother feel better for having been to church? Well, when she was in church, she didn't have to be the caring mother. She didn't have to be the dutiful wife. She didn't have to be the responsible neighbor. She could just be. She could just exist. She didn't have to do anything. Somebody else was in charge. Somebody else was taking care of her. So understanding that despising the resident Pharisees is not going to make you any better than they are. That was the I problem. The Pharisee was despising the publican who came in, the tax collector who came in. And if we begin to despise the Pharisees, the bad guys, then we will be just as pharisaical as they are. Instead, we need to pray for ourselves. Because a person with genuine, genuine humility does not compare himself to the best or the worst of humanity. A person of genuine humility doesn't compare himself to others at all. Genuine humility rests in the care of God. It understands that we are inadequate to save ourselves or to make ourselves fit company for being in the presence of God. Persons with genuine humility come into worship with that understanding that <coughs> they find genuine acceptance at the hand of God. When they leave, of course, they feel better because they feel and they know forgiveness. <coughs> I want to tell you something that happened this week. I was in a meeting at, uh, down in uh, Albemarle at Main Street United Methodist Church. <clears throat> the district superintendent holds a meeting quarterly, and I go to those meetings because I'm a pastor and she's my boss, and, you know, I have to go to those meetings. But, you know, I, I kind of enjoy them because sometimes I hear something that is actually uh, really important for me individually and for me as a pastor in terms of communicating the gospel, in terms of being a, a good pastor, or trying to be anyway. <clears throat> and she usually reserves the last part of the meeting for worship time with a time for communion. And we have the Eucharist, we have the Lord's Supper, we have communion together. And uh, it's nice to sit in a room with uh, 50, 60 other pastors and um, and have the district superintendent lead us through that time. I usually do that. I'm usually the one leading in that service. And, and to sit in that service and to be part of it and participate that way is, is special for me. I, I really appreciate it. But this time, she didn't lead us through it. She allowed two of the Hispanic pastors in our, um, in our district to lead this service. And they, they used a different form of the Great Thanksgiving. What I'm going to talk about for just a second is that time in the great thanksgiving. There comes a time, remember when we confess our sins, when we have the Lord's Supper, there's a time for confessing our sins, right? And we go through a litany, maybe it's a written form, or maybe it's just a one-word response, yes, I, I do, or whatever it might be. But then at the end of that time of the great thanksgiving and the time of confessing our sins, the pastor says something to you like this. This is the good news that in Jesus Christ your sins 
are forgiven. Remember that phrase? Your sins are forgiven. And what is the response that you give back to the pastor? In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Right? So, I'm saying it to you. You're saying it to me. We're saying it to each other. God is saying it out of heaven. Your sins are forgiven. And this is what the Hispanic pastor wanted us to do. He said, when you hear that phrase, your sins are forgiven. He says, I want you to applaud. And he said, let's practice that. Let's, let's practice that. Let's, let's, let's applaud. He said, oh, by the way, why do we applaud anyway? We applaud because we, we think something is good. We applaud because we agree with something. We applaud because somebody did something wonderful. He said, didn't Jesus do something wonderful? Isn't that why we would applaud at a time when we hear, your sins are forgiven you? He said, let's practice together. He said, let's clap together. And this is what we heard. <laughs> he said, you know, if somebody gave you a gift of a million dollars and you were told to applaud, you'd be after it. I mean, you'd be jumping up and down. He said, let's applaud. And then it was different. Let's try that. Your sins are forgiven. And you know what? He didn't let he didn't let us off that easy. He said, no, 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 you quit too soon. <laughs> he said, stand up, all you preachers. And then we had to applaud for five minutes straight. You know how much your hand hurts <laughs> applauding for five minutes straight? But I think it was on purpose. I think he did it on purpose so that the feeling would stay for a while. Isn't that, isn't that what this is all about? When you go in to pray, remember that if your prayer is genuine, like the publican, like the tax collector, the bad guy, the renegade, the traitor of a Jew, when your prayer is genuine, oh Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. Think how much forgiveness means. So if you have a tendency to be a Pharisee, you've been a good boy or a good girl all of your life, this would be a good time to have an eye check. How do you feel about the bad people? How do you feel about the bad people? And a second question, have you asked for mercy recently? <coughs> you know, if you don't want the answers that you heard in your own spirit, to those two questions about how you feel about the bad people and whether or not you've asked for mercy recently, you can change positions. You can leave the confident, erect, self-assured stance of the Pharisee. And you can become the humble, barely there, publican. You stand in humility before God. You pray in humility asking mercy for your sins and you receive his love and his welcoming embrace. That is how to put an end to the I problem. Or you could sing a song like 419. I am thine to do, O Lord, I heard your voice and told you I love to me. I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to the Let's stand together.